Molo Sambonani, hello, how's it? Good evening. Shalom, people. Chinonk. And welcome to another episode of the Big Daddy Liberty Show. It's going to be a uh, rather interesting one, fast and blitzy in its nature. <laughs> but uh, welcome to it. My name is Rusile Gobesa, a.k.a. BDL or Big Daddy Liberty. Uh, remember, it is a Wednesday evening at 7.30. And as you're joining us, all I ask that you do is that you hit that like button. Come on, do it now. Help me share and, uh, of course, spread the show to a much wider audience. Welcome to it. It is BDL in the house. We have a special guest tonight. Uh, but before I get into any of that, if you are looking to support the Big Daddy Liberty Show, I'll probably link that in the descriptor of the video. Prepare yourself, brace yourself, good people. We have a website currently under development and uh, merchandise also cooking in the background, uh, in the planning phases as we begin to actually grow the show. Um, there's a lot of demand for this sort of content and we're bringing up uh, and bringing in rather uh, a, a very interesting lineup of uh, thinkers, uh, center-right thinkers, people who value liberty, whether they're conservatives, classical liberals or libertarians. The very sort of ideas you don't hear in the mainstream media. So the Big Daddy Liberty Show will be the home for those sort of ideas. So welcome to it. It is a Wednesday night. The BDL show is on your screens. Guys, tonight I want to have a conversation around two things primarily. Number one, the state of the economy. We can all see where things are going. We can all feel where things are at the moment. And the question on everybody's minds is, what do we do? What do we do to stave off what will be the very bad effects of years of bad policy on the one hand, and of course, um, the, the international headwinds, economic headwinds that South Africa will also experience. And in that conversation, we're going to talk about the very people who've been locked out of this economy for the longest of times. And that is primarily poor people, and invariably, the most of whom are poor black individuals. And I can even go one more level in my specificity insofar as saying poor black young individuals have been by and large the very people who have been locked out of the economy. So the question then becomes, after 30 years of failed ANC policy that has not created an inclusive economy, that has created an economy of effectively insiders, political insiders, and the rest of us, the outsiders, the economic outsiders, how do we break that stranglehold and how do we begin to put in place uh, policy proposals which are more inclusive in nature? In that regard, hey man, I, um, I uh, looked around, uh, you know, in the literature, I looked around in people who are writing at the moment and a wonderful article came uh, my way that was written by tonight's guest who, um, excuse me, as I literally make sure I'm not stepping on something alive here. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, just a cable, my bad. Uh, but to ask guests, Benjamin Shulman, of course, who heads up, uh, I think it's public policy at the South African Zionist Federation, wrote a fantastic, fantastic piece, which I think is important for the rest of us, which is why isn't South Africa learning from countries like Israel and other countries who have similar um, I'll call it socioeconomic uh, factors such as ours, insofar as the Israelis, you know, they are a predominantly Jewish country, but it has about 20% of their population being Arabs, Arabs, Arab Israelis. And the question is, how have they created, the Israelis that is, an inclusive economy, one which grows as theirs does, one that innovates as theirs does, and one that creates a, uh, if you will, a home where every Israeli citizen is able to make an income. Now, I suppose that's where I'm going to bring my guest in, who is, of course, from the SA Zionist Federation. Uh, you'll forgive me if you see me looking that way a lot. <laughs> my little monitor is here, if I can just find the mouse. Um, my guest, of course, from the SA Zionist Federation, who wrote on this topic and who will help us unpack it tonight as we ask the questions, what lessons can we learn as South Africans from the Israelis in building an inclusive economy? There he is on screen. I think there he is. Benji Shulman. Good evening. Hi. Hi, Sita. How are you doing? Nice to be with you. 
very, very good, brother, and very good to have you on the show. Benji, look, tonight's show is going to be a relatively brief one, because on the one hand, I want us to unpack some of your key thoughts in the article that you wrote this week, and great article at that, by the way, but also begin to look at the broader issue as to how we can translate you know, um, what the Israelis do, really, for us here in South Africa. Now, Benji, you'll know, and anybody who's a fan of the show will know, that when I was in Israel a couple of years ago, I did a three-part series on some of the tech innovation, some of the things they do in that part of the world, especially around farming and agriculture, which we as South Africans could be learning here. But Benji, you've made a more bigger argument here, which is on issues of the economy in that part of the world, for example, the tech sector, They've been trying to bring in Arab Israelis. What's going on there, Benji? Give us a, a sense of what you wrote in the article. Yeah, thanks, Zichli. So, so I think the, the point of the article was that, uh, although I did focus on Arab Israelis, there's also a, a whole sector of uh, very orthodox uh, or observant Jews um, mm. who, who were also not participating in the sector of the of, of, of the high-tech sector in Israel. So if you find in Israel, as you said, 20% of the population is... Um, Arab, they're not Jewish, they're either Muslim or Druze, which is a, another group, or Christian, or, or whatever, um, and and they and 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 they are um, are not participating in this in this high tech thing. Although they participate in every other part of the of of the the, the group, you get lots of doctors, lots of um, uh, lots of. Excuse me, just lots had a of little people. visitor there. That's okay. Nice to you, Benji. Nice to you. Um, I'm like that dude from the BBC. So you, you get, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, there's there's doctors, there's uh, lawyers. You get people in the media. The the, the Israelis have several have had several Arab Israeli judges. The first Muslim, mm -hmm. including the first mu woman Muslim judges, um, have, have started. So you find that Arab Israelis are well represented in the society, but the one place they're not being represented is in the um, is is in this high tech sector, and so. What happened recently is you had a, uh, an Arab party join the Israeli coalition. There's like seven parties mm. that are running the country at the moment. And you had this this group that came in. And so this was a, a, a politically good opportunity for them to start saying, well, well, how do we start to fix this? And how do we how do we bring in? And, and there's been a tremendous growth in in uh, in, in the sort of at the engineering level uh you know you, you get people to start businesses and you got the the tech engineers and we we've seen a big growth in the last decade of arab israelis entering the sector but uh it's still very small in proportion to the population and also um, not enough people starting businesses because that's really what the what the israeli uh, er, economic miracle is all about is this startup nation where you have more you know i think israel's number three in the world on the nasdaq of companies that are listed on the nasdaq after i think china and america so so, so how do you get more of these Arab Israelis, um, first of all, working in the sector, and then also uh, starting businesses? And that's and that's there's a new policy out there, spending 150 million dollars on trying to take the startup nation, which is what they call Israel, and really take it to 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 the masses, uh, and particularly into those those sectors of the society that haven't done anything on it so far. And you know. It I think this is actually quite important because, you know, in the article you mentioned that we're not talking about a few people here, you know, maybe uh, maybe 500,000 or a million. You know, these are individuals who make up effectively 21% of that population. It's over 9 million um, Israelis in that part of the world who effectively on one level or the other um, are at various levels of participation, as you said. In fact, in the article you mentioned, insofar as tech, the participation is as low as 2 to 3%. Now, there can be parallels drawn if you look at those sort of numbers, arguably, to South Africans, and in particular, you know, black youth in this country, whose unemployment levels, for example, have reached a staggering level of 70%. Um, if you look at the data in this country, there is something fundamentally wrong in a policy approach, Benji, that, that simply ignores those individuals. Now, talk to me about that impetus, if you will, from the Israelis. You're talking about them spending 150 million rand. We're not hearing them spending that kind of money on flags or on Ukraine or, you know, any of these arbitrary things that you see either here in South Africa or in other parts of the geopolitical world. They're clearly investing in their citizens. They're putting Israelis first, in a sense. So, so what, the, what the idea is, is, is where this is coming is from two, two places. The one is that it's actually just a supply problem. So Israel, 
uh, has this high tech uh, um, uh, economy. And what they found is that they were starting to run out of the skills that are necessary to um, to to deal with it. So so the so one of the things that they've done is a, a proper visa visa regime that uh, that allows technical skills into the country quickly and effectively. Especially Israelis who've left uh, allows them to come back home and 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 is and 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 sort of helps those people. But what they're saying is instead of using uh, outsourcing the labor force. Isn't this an opportunity to upgrade the labor force and parts of the society that are not in parts of the, the tech economy? And how do we get them involved? Now, the difference, I think, between Israel and South Africa is in Israel, they have a very strong economy. It is running very well. There is a good tech sector. And there is, and I didn't talk about this in the piece, but there is crucially a very strong education. So it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or Arab or everyone gets a strong education uh, in math and science and language and, and whatever, and that gives you a, a good base. That what's what's keeping Arab Israelis out is not uh, it's not first of all it's not political it's not discrimination which you know I, I imagine some people if you read the South African media you might assume that but it's but also talking point. yeah exactly so it's it's not political uh, but it's more it's it's cultural it's how the the tech ecosystem works there it's geographical so people who are far away from opportunities so the what this is trying to do is to take a, a growing economy a working economy and saying how do we include it uh, and include further people and i think as as south africans we're we're a couple of steps behind because we we our education system is not putting out the maths and science skills that we need for high tech or not high tech just to participate in the modern world and and also then some of the policies are actually not being as inclusive. They're not actually inclusive. They're creating this rent-seeking class that's that's not productive. And I think you've hit the nail in the head. And there's fundamentally two areas that I think we'll settle on and we'll wrap up with effectively in the next sort of 10 minutes, if you don't mind, um, mm -hmm. Benji. Number one, it's the idea of a government that, that recognizes need, as is, that is, Sorry, I'm trapped by my own sentence construction here. Let me take two steps back. You've initially pointed out a government that recognizes need based on a kind of an economy that it is. That is, they looked at Israel, they said, look, this is what we're really good at. These are the sort of people who are lagging so far as they're not in uh, a part of it on the one hand, but also there's a greater imperative. Making them a part of it you know, expands the, that part of the economy or that sector locally. It benefits, if you will, a wider supply chain. This is so that's something South Africans, are, are arguably, if I can listen to what you said, could benefit with here. Uh, the second, of course, is the element of, and you know, you mentioned um, the issue of, oh, pardon me, I mentioned the issue of government, but I want to bring in the politics. I actually want to bring in the politics because it's kind of important in the sense of where Israel is now, we could be heading in that direction too. That is coalition governments. You know, we're heading in a situation where the ANC is losing power and Invariably, if you look at the local government elections, it has been a cobbling together of political parties that run various local government parties. Now, if that is what bodes for the local, uh, national government election, pardon me, you then have to look at something like the Israelis, who in this election have, as you said, an Arab party, Ra'am, um, cobbling that together. But this is where I wanted to chime in. A consensus, if you will, from that perspective that you've got to get the basics of government right in order for the economy to then thrive. And part of that, and if we, we do share this with the Israelis, is security. Benji, talk to me about that part of it. Tom. You simply cannot have a growing, prosperous, property-earning economy if the people in your economy or in your society are not secure. Yeah, so, so look, I think... First of all, on the coalition point, uh, uh, Franz Cronier wrote a very good piece in the Business Day talking about the fact that actually the Israeli political system and the South African political system are actually exactly the same if you look at proportional representation and, and all of that sort of thing. And uh, South Africa has been unusual in that we've had these very dominant uh, political groupings, whether even before, you know, during apartheid, if you just looked at the white voters, you know, you had this MP for like 40 years that no one could get rid of, and now we've had the ANC. And as the as the system starts to normalize, in a sense, we're probably going to be seeing a system that looks much more like Israel's because that's a, a society where they basically from the founding of the state had coalitions. And so I think that that uh, France's piece, is, I, I thought it was very interesting and and actually very hopeful. I thought that because he talked about how that can affect policy reform on the on the security part of it. So, look, 
it's, it's an interesting thing because an enormous amount of the Israeli budget has traditionally and still goes towards the military. We're talking, it's the, I'm standing in correction here, but it's probably the single biggest um, line item on the budget. Uh, and it and it costs uh, the, the society a great deal. Like if you're in Israel, things are expensive and, and, and there's reasons for that. And one of them is that there's a large amount of tax that goes into funding a very you know it's conscription for men and women if you if you you have to go to the army for three years if you're a man for two years if you're a, a woman uh, and so the army is is a very important part of um is, is keeping a stable society because if you don't have that then uh the you know and it's different from us because we have a crime problem there the, the problem is that you have uh people who are shooting rockets at your at your houses for, uh, in 20 seconds so so i think that that is a, a, a crucial part of it. What is interesting is that the what's called the IDF, the, the Israeli Defense Forces, is actually a crucible for some of the innovation that we're seeing. Because what you're doing is you're having the youth, 18-year-olds, who get sent into the army, and you, you're saying to this kid, "Look, you need to figure out how do <laughs> how do we deal with a rocket that's being fired from Gaza? Uh, you know, is could and and they have to come up with an idea on how to stop it, which is how you have something like the Iron Dome, which shoots the missile out the sky, which is kind of incredible if you think about it, right? It's a defensive weapon that stops civilians being killed on both sides. And and so when these kids come out the army after three years, they've they've been in more difficult circumstances than any commercial situation. And so then they're able to apply that to the the innovation sector, and then you have civilian uses for things. So it, it, the, the army and security is a big part of Israeli culture because Without it, they understand that you can't have a sort of functioning uh, economy. And and there is there's stories, in fact, of of uh, when wartime has happened, of of the innovation groups saying, "Well, we have to keep the economy running anyway because if we don't, then the investors are going to think that this is a place that you can't go to um, and, and invest in." And so it's it's understood very carefully. And I was about to say that, that last point is actually spot on because it's what translates into the South African experience. And let me be precise. No one is going to invest in our townships, for example. No one is going to invest in our rural areas if they do not perceive a sense of being safe. And being safe means the protection by the state of your life, your liberty, your freedoms, that is, and your property, your property rights, the ability to say, this is mine. This little um shoe that i'm building as a shoemaker is mine because i'm seeking to i'm seeking the freedom pardon me to sell it to trade the freedom to trade and someone has to defend my life my safety from the criminal who would want to uh affect those three uh god-given rights if i can put it that way so maybe in conclusion um you know there might be someone listening to the show and thinking hang on i, I still don't quite get it you know like how does this solve the issue of the, the 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 culture if you will in south africa and this is what i'm arguing your the thrust of your piece was or was a defense and an encouragement of an entrepreneurial spirit especially in the very communities where inclusivity was never the case either currently or historically this is where south africa is exactly in that same boat black youth especially those in townships, have never been seen as um, the kind of people to be included in the economy, whether through colonial days, apartheid, or even in today's society. And for me, Israel forms an important, uh, amongst other countries, uh, an important litmus test and example um, for us, no? Yeah, and, and, and I think, look, we, we're not saying that South Africa, it's not about the, the high-tech sector, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that these lessons are applicable if you're doing agriculture, if you're doing mining, if you're doing tourism, all of these things are actually participatory things for precisely the kinds of people who you're talking about who are currently being excluded in the economy. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that initially, at least, it's going to be jobs that are the way that the unions might like or or, or as effect, you know, the, the, the way that we tend to think about employment. But mm. but. As South Africans, if we could just get those three sectors, who we, we have a lot of advantages. I mean, I'll give you an example, Zikla, and it, it, it's mm -hmm. sort of interesting because of the Israeli thing. I met an Israeli farmer who who came to South Africa, and what he had done in Israel, he's, he had created a kind of a, a citrus, which he was growing. And he was growing it in Israel, but it's on two seasons. So they want to grow it both sides of the year. So they wanted to bring it to South Africa and grow it here. 
and then and then you can export it in the off season if, if that makes any mm-hmm. sense. And he said South Africa is such an amazing country. He said you've got the land, you've got the water, uh, or sometimes the water. Uh, you've got amazing labor, and you've got knowledge of how how farming operates. He says I can come here in an Israeli with a little bit of tech, right? And we can plant it in the ground, and we can create jobs, we can create the enterprise, and we can export it to the rest of the world. And, and bring uh, and, and bring that and South Africa could really be an amazing place where we can open up our doors to the world and say guys bring your tech bring your knowledge bring whatever you want bring it to our country and we will provide the launch pad where you can make the best products the best services the best uh, w- whatever uh, and and come and employ our people so that we that, so that we can get this 40 percent job rate down uh, unemployment rate down and 75 percent for the youth and, and get it down now so that you know, people can gain skills, they can learn, they can understand. Uh, and I think that South Africa could really has an opportunity to be the center of, of a lot of innovation because we have all the resources, but but we're not quite putting in the policy frameworks to make sure that that happens. And uh, yeah, maybe on that note, uh, Benji, we, we're going to have to call it and a big thanks for you to join, for joining me tonight. Um, but I, as I always do, Benji, final word from you as the guest, uh, your final thoughts, um, and of course, how do the folks reach you uh, on your social media if you want to be found or the Zionist Fed? Yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. So yeah, I think I think um, I think people mustn't be despondent. We've got a great country, and uh, it, and it and it can be uh, it can be greater. But we do need to get uh, some of the thinking right and some of the policy right, and and we need to look at some examples. And Israel is a good example of of how a small country with not much in the way of resources has become a regional powerhouse in the Middle East in all sorts of ways. And there's no reason why South Africa can't emulate that in, in Southern Africa. We do already, but we need to keep that, maintain that position. Uh, and if people want to see the kind of stuff we're doing, um, the, the best way is you can go on our Facebook page, the South African Friends of Israel. Uh, there's lots of updates about what's going on politically, not politically, culturally, etc. And uh, I think people would uh, appreciate it if you if you go and have a look there. Absolutely. And on that wonderful, wonderful note, let me say a big thank you to Upra Benji from the Zionist Fed. Shout out to you, homie. I'll see you in Joburg soon enough when I'm in that part of the world. That's, of course, Benji Shulman from the SA Zionist Federation. And, of course, as a final point that Benji makes, he's absolutely correct. Guys, resources do not make a country rich. Let me repeat that resources do not make a country rich. South Africa has many resources, lots of resources from mining to uh, fisheries, to the flora and the fauna, to the very even people in this country. However, if you do not have stable institutions of government, stable institutions of society that protect life, liberty and property rights, then you're going nowhere. For example, here's a good example. Singapore, or better yet, um, you know, Hong Kong had, Hong Kong in particular, it's, it's a rock in the middle of the sea. It has zero, zero natural resources, yet it is fabulously rich today, simply because it focused on building strong institutions that protect life, liberty, and property rights. That's why people of Hong Kong are very mindful of an incursion, for example, from the Chinese, because it affects those very things that are the foundation of their society. And simply put, and this is the argument I'm making, much like Hong Kong, much like Israel, South Africa needs to focus on building strong institutions that protect and, and foster a climate of a stable society where people can actually ha- live free, prosperous, uh, non-racial, and of course, property owning existence uh, in the country. And you can only do that if you protect life, liberty, and property rights. So let me know what you guys think. Um, Interesting little conversation with Upra Benji. Uh, He's someone who will hopefully have on the show on this and other issues, because as you guys know, the show is very, very pro-Israel. This is a Zionist platform. So for those who are surprised, (gasps) why is he having a Zionist pet guy on? Now you know. But uh, with that being said, thank you guys for watching. Super enjoy that. If you like that, that is, hit that like button. And I'll see you guys on Sunday for Liberty and Friends. And with that being said, a reminder, as I always say at the end of every show, never trust a commie.